very much. It's fantastic to be here today and to speak with such a great group of people. Thanks, thanks so much, Jenny, for organising this as well. And it's been a while in the, the making, bringing yeah, us together. So thank you so much. Um, it's also great to be um, speaking after Paul because um, I'm actually going to show some pictures of a couple of things that Paul mentioned. So see if you can, with their game, you can see if you can um, recognise the, the things I've got photos of. So yeah, I, um, this is what I proposed to talk about and I looked at it this morning and thought, oh no, that looks really difficult. Um, <laughs> so um, so um, that's what I'm going to, I'm going to try and, and tackle. But um, yeah, what I really want to start to think about is what a future-focused ethnographic practice, what it can actually do in terms of helping us to think about designing for responsible and ethical digital futures, and, and, and ways that account for contingency and improvisation and um, the kinds of concepts that we're working with as anthropologists in terms of trying to understand why people do things and how things play out and also trying to help us to understand some of the temporalities which anthropology just doesn't usually and hasn't historically engaged with, particularly the future. Um, but also trying to think about what kind of anticipatory modes already construct the contemporary society that we're living in, and which make it difficult for us to also make shifts in terms of the way we might work by bringing together anthropology and ethnography and design in ways that can actually kind of shift some of the ways we think about design, but not only design, any kind of discipline or practice that tries to make interventions in the world. And the idea also of thinking about going beyond a solutions-based approach to making change in the world towards a possibilities-based approach, which I think is actually really important and should, or should be underpinning the way we think about creating responsible and ethical digital futures. But I think that the particular contemporary trends, there are lots of existing trends and emergent trends, and one of the most worrying things for me is the trend of data-driven design, data-driven policy, which is being written about in the, in the media as well as academics being concerned about it. So how can we actually work as designers and academics to try to counter some of the most problematic and deeply worrying aspects of trends like data-driven design? and the kinds of things that emerge from that, like predictive policing and all of these other really worrying um, issues that, that are coming about. And I think that's also where, when we start thinking about design and digital futures, that there's a really interesting crossover in terms of the way that digital design, digital design has a growing capacity to become a form of intervention in the world in ways that it probably didn't in the past. So I think it's a really important moment for designers and particularly people working in fields of digital design and for those of us who are not designers so much but anthropologists and ethnographers who do work around digital technology but also try to understand societal change and how these things are all emerging at the same time. How we can actually come to, together to think about ways to act positively in, in this context. So what did I, I want to talk about? Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about was anthropology. And um, one of the things I've been, I've been an anthropologist, the, my, the way I started as an anthropologist. Um, and um, for me, one of the most important shifts for anthropology as it connects with design is actually moving away from an anthropology that focuses on what's already happened. So anthropologist, for anthropologists, there's a problem of working in the, the present and the future because ethically it's very hard for us to write about the continuous present or the future because it's always been considered to be a form of objectifying the people we're writing about. So if you look at any good anthropological study, it will always write about what's happened in the, in the past because anything you observe in the present goes immediately into the past. But that's the other exciting aspect of that that I think anthropology has missed, is that everything that you're observing or engaging with in the present is also slipping over into its future. And as anthropologists and as ethnographers, what we're actually investigating is a present that's moving, continually moving on into the future. Time doesn't ever stand still. So anthropologists and ethnographers have the fantastic advantage that the kind of work we can do actually engages with those very moments where the future emerges, the, near, the immediate future. And I like to think of terms of immediate future, near future, and completely imagined and unknown future. Um, I think those are the key temporalities that ethnographers need to learn to engage with. Need, we need to find also new ways and new techniques of engaging with those futures. One of the ways in which I've been trying to engage with 
those futures, uh, is through ethnographic research with different technologies. Um, but also through thinking about what kind of concepts can we use to what, what can we research? What kind of experiences of the world can we research if we want to understand how futures emerge? And um, that's why the next slide, which you can't see, but I thought you could, um, <laughs> highlights these concepts of anticipatory concepts of trust, hope, anxiety, and uncertainty. There are others. So there's risk, um, expectation, which Paul was talking about. There's a whole host of them. And what you tend to find when you look at um, how, they, how they're engaged with this concept of the sociological, anthropological, geographical, and philosophical literature is that they're always clustered together and used in relationship to each other. So there's actually a really exciting cluster of anticipatory concepts, which are all actually about how we feel in the world. And they're all also about how we might need to feel or how we might feel about what we're going to do next. And all these concepts are also actually about how we cope with not knowing what's going to happen next at all. And um, that's one of the, it's also one, that's also one of the things that society deals with in different ways as well. And we, we live in a society, which is, before I have to say that, I'll just say this is one of the things that Paul mentioned, that is a car test site <laughs> in, the, in, in um, the middle of Sweden. Um, those are not real buildings, obviously, and that's a Swedish forest. Um, <laughs> it's part of the, the idea of spotting things. But the, um, and this is a, and that's from one of the projects I work on, which is about autonomous driving cars in Sweden. This is another area of research that I've done a lot of work in, which is about um, occupational safety and health in the construction industry, which might seem that it's got little to do with design. But um, it's really representative for me of the kind of um, risk-averse, audit-based, predictive cultures that, that we live in. So we live in societies, um, largely anyway, here in Australia, US, UK, or the, and um, the kind of societies that we're living in are societies where there's a continual process of predicting things that could go wrong in the future, and then developing scenarios, imagining scenarios of things that could happen, and then inventing processes to stop those things from happening. And that's what risk and anticipation are all about. That's what that's why we have insurance companies. Um, that's it's also why we have audit cultures. But it's also why we all of us who work in universities have to do ethical approval processes for all of the research we do. Because all of those really are about is constructing future scenarios where something unethical can happen, and then inventing a set of things that we could potentially do to stop those <coughs> things from happening. None of those processes will actually stop unethical things from happening, but they will all make the system believe that everything's been sorted out and we don't have to worry about anything because it will all be all right because we've followed the procedure. Occupational safety and health is one of the best examples because safe health and safety regulations construct a whole series of things that could potentially go wrong and accidents would happen, and then a whole series of things that you're meant to do in order to stop those things from happening. But then, so why do accidents still happen? They do. One of the reasons why accidents don't happen is because those systems don't work. Um, one of the other reasons why accidents don't happen is because, because human beings continually improvise to, step, to take that step over into the future. Um, and we, we always improvise because the same thing can never happen twice. So we're continually actually stepping over into a future that's a slightly different. We're always filling in the gaps a little bit. There's no template for being able to do the same thing again or being able to do exactly what somebody else has already done. So that's the area that I think is most important for ethnographers to study and to try to connect to design somehow. So where have we, we've been trying to do this then, and this is the book, this is also Paul mentioned, this is the Anthropology of the Futures book. And I work with a group called the Future Anthropology Network of the um, European Association of Social Anthropologists, and this is our first book. Um, we've been really trying to push then our work towards looking at the future, understanding the future is always uncertain, we never know what's going to happen next. Um, being critical about and worried about predictive economic modelling and big data modelling and how they're actually designed, used in design to anticipate futures. But they can't really tell us what futures are like because data is always flawed, it's always not perfect. It's like what Paul was saying about um, artificial intelligence experts, or exactly the people who know that those kinds of technologies that they're making don't really exist and the future is quite um, 
very uncertain. There's lots of uncertainty. People who do big data analytics also know that big data is deeply flawed. Um, but unfortunately, the regulatory agencies who might use it, for things like predictive policing or whatever, don't believe that it's flawed and use it in really problematic ways. So the future anthropologist approach takes up some concepts that I also think are deeply important. The concept of contingency, thinking about the contingency of the past, of the present, and the future. And thinking then about how people actually improvise to step over into what happens next. And we're always improvising in relation to the contingent circumstances in which we live in the present. So the second book, um, which I wanted to mention, is a book called Uncertainty and Possibility where we're really actually trying to push some of these concepts a bit further, acknowledging that everything's uncertain and saying, well, if everything's uncertain, how can we actually design solutions for a world that can't exist out there in the future? So why would we want to put solutions into a future that we don't actually know enough about in order to design solutions for? So maybe instead of designing solutions, we should be designing possibilities. And in fact, any technological solution that's designed to solve a problem is not really ever a solution anyway because anything that's designed and that is produced and put out there as complete will actually just create new forms of improvisation and create new possibilities. So we shouldn't really see anything as a closed solution. We should really see everything as, as opening up possibilities somehow. But the important thing is actually recognizing that and really trying to understand that maybe the objective should be to actually design open technologies that can somehow um, go into the future with their users and enable and empower users to actually create um, new ways of, of forms of well-being and being able to achieve things in the world that they want to. There's a really good example actually from the construction industry project that I shared the slide from. In that project we actually looked at a small company who instead of um, trying to get workers to use safety regulations from manuals and lots of, lots of construction workers are only semi-literate and they can't necessarily read long manuals of, of details about how to work safely. They actually started to produce, produce a series of videos of safe working practices made by construction workers themselves that other workers could share and use to learn from to actually create ways of working safely. So you start to think about any kind of intervention that can open up possibilities empowers people and actually engages people as well. The other message is that if you're trying to create a new product, and it's a commercial product, if it's a product that will engage people, then your market is likely to be much bigger. So I've summed this up in a slide that um, tries to bring together these concepts of contingency and improvisation, sums up what I was saying, but also takes some reference to some of the <coughs> anthropological and design anthropological literature there. And the things that I think are really important to pick up on are these points about the fact that our futures are contingent because the present is as well. And also Andrew Irving, whose work I really love, and I really like how he puts it when he says the radical contingency, he talks about what he calls the radical contingency of the future including the futures that do not, that we do not, and we will never know about. So there are futures that are possible, possible for us to imagine and futures that, which, which will never happen. So there's a, the, the uncertainty of, of the future, I think, is just so fundamental to underpin all of our thinking about um, how we might think about digital futures. So to go on, um, We've been doing research about some of these questions across a range of contexts. This is actually an internet, this is taken from an Internet of Energy meetup talk in Melbourne, in, in Richmond, not far from here. Um, we've been doing research in makerspaces, this is Make Create in Brunswick East, or Brunswick. Um, we've also been doing work in Barcelona, and this is the Smart Citizen Project in the Fab Lab. Um, this is one of the directors of Smart Citizen, and um, this is one of the technologies. But the reason why I was kind of coming across here to talk about smart citizen, because this is actually a really exciting example of a quite open technology that's been very successful in Barcelona as a sense of technology in terms of sharing data, but also because their platform is open and, and all of their technologies are shared, then people can do what they like with their platform and they can redesign stuff for themselves and, and make it meaningful for themselves in their own way. So it's, my argument is not that 
technologies are designed for solutions and is closed. But there's not, not all technology designs to close solutions. But, and there's some really it's, it's interesting examples of technologies that are designed as more open possibilities. And there's a lot to learn from some of these initiatives. Um, this is another thing that Paul talked about. This is, this is something that was in the news yesterday, which I thought was <laughs> absolutely great. Um, and and it's, it's, not, it's not even actually directly relevant to the, the talk. <laughs> um, one of the projects I work on in Sweden is, is about autonomous driving cars, and there we collaborate with Volvo. And um, we, it, we, we're doing some really exciting ethnography there. <laughs> and um, the, um, the point of... Um, I don't remember the point now. But, <laughs> yeah, um, AD cars is that... Yeah, it, it takes me back to the construction industry as well, though, because AD cars are really, really exciting. And, and people... The thing about AD cars is that people have always customised their cars. Does, does anybody imagine that people aren't going to hack into their AD cars and tinker with them? You know, I mean, this, I, I, it seems to me that there's no question that an ADR is, AD car is ultimately a closed technology. But, but the, the conundrum is, and the problem here is really what I was talking about before, about the kind of risk-averse audit culture with all these regulatory frameworks that we live in. Because it's very difficult to introduce into the motor industry and the idea of designing an AD car that's actually open to the possibilities of what people will do with it. Because all of the, the imagined possibilities of what people will do with it are probably quite dangerous. Um, whereas AD cars are actually being designed to be much safer than... Um, human you know, driven cars um, so that's one of the issues the same with occupational safety and health it's very difficult to design for an open kind of safety solutions because the whole idea of, of safety is to close things down and stop people from doing things that say are dangerous so I think there's a, there's a really interesting kind of cultural narratives and societal processes that are working alongside each other and that meet as well because if there wasn't an innovation paradigm that was about creating design closed finished technologies then the technologies wouldn't be there for people to improvise with and demonstrate to us that people do other things with them um, and that really is the space that I've been interested in in talking to you about I think I'm going to finish now because I've probably gone over time haven't I? Um, I wasn't checking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I was too interested. <laughs> but um, I guess I would go on to say that you know some of the other things that we've been doing. These are these two slides are from the um, blockchain Bitcoin Centre here in in Melbourne, um, where I think I just put those in the presentation because I thought that they were great as well. <laughs> but. Um, the reason why they're there is to remind me of the last thing that I wanted to talk about, which is the last thing in that difficult abstract I gave to Jenny, which is that um, I think that part of this agenda for me involves rethinking questions about how, how digital anxieties and, and trust, digital trust are constituted and how they lived out in everyday life. Um, and this project was one where we did start to look at questions around anxieties and trust. We'll I look at trust across all of my, my projects. Um, and that's actually what brings me to one of the points that I wanted to make um, that connect with um, human-computer interaction design, which emerges across you know, most of the projects I work on at the moment. There's another really interesting thing that working with concepts like trust and anxiety and hope, etc., bring to the fore. And the reason why I started to work on the concept of trust and then started to look at these further anticipatory concepts and in relation to trust and uncertainty that that I was already looking at is because trust is one of the questions that comes up in computer interaction design a lot. It's one of the questions, how can we get people to trust this new technology? How can you get people to trust a new autonomous driving car? How can you get people to trust a new interface? And um, what the research has shown me very much is that trust, the reason for interrogating these anticipatory concepts and understanding exactly how people do step over from the present into the immediate future is that trust is never just between a person and a technology. Trust isn't about interaction, and trust is not transactional either. It's not just about it's something that happens between two people or two organisations. One of the problems in, the, um, in driving and car research is that most of that research looks at the relationship between the driver and the car. And again, it's about the interaction between a human and, and a machine. And it's, 
the whole point for me is that when we start to think about how people step over into the next futures, it's not just about your interaction with one other thing. It's actually about how you feel comfortable and ready enough to move over and to take those next steps. And again, I guess it takes me back to the whole point about working across <coughs> ethnography and design, and ethnography and technology design. It's because that's what we see when we do ethnographic research with people in their presence and going on into their immediate futures. It's very much about how people feel about what's happening in that moment, how they step over, what rituals and routines and aspects of their everyday life make them feel comfortable enough to be able to do what's next. And um, that, I think, is also part of this question about designing for responsible digital futures. How do we actually design for those futures that people are going to feel comfortable in and happy enough in, and the people that, in which people are not going to feel anxious about their data and what's being done with it and what, it, what policies, it, policies it can possibly drive um, that will make things happen to them which will not make them feel comfortable. Okay, thank, thank you. you.